Good morning, church. It is another beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Kyla, and on behalf of the team here at CTC, I would just like to welcome you, especially our church online community. Can we give a warm welcome to our church online family? If today is your first time joining us, we would love to get to know you. You can text the word guest to the number on the screen, or you can stop by the connect table on your way out of service where a team member will be ready to help you get plugged in. Our scripture for today is found in Lamentations 3, verses 21 through 23. It says, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. Church, will you join me for a moment in prayer? Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that we can gather in your house and we can gather here to worship you and learn your word. Father, we pray a blessing over the worship. We pray a blessing over every person in here and a blessing over Pastor Ty as he gives the message today. God, we love you and we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In your son's name, amen. All right, church, let's stand and get ready to worship together. Come on, let's put our hands together this morning. Lord is in this place 
on, church, let's declare you hallelujah again. People singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, oh, we declare today. And all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. And all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. to celebrate as we watch someone go public with their faith today. My name is Tiffany. I have always known God, but he has, hasn't always been at the forefront of my life. Because of that, I lived a life of self-doubt, anxiety, and depression. I never felt like I was good enough mother, wife, daughter, you name it. I would use myself down until I couldn't do it anymore. I was tired of constantly living in anxiety in a dark, depressive state. 
A close friend of mine always spoke of CTC and how wonderful the church, pastor, and people were. It intrigued me. But, wrote, but what really did it for me was seeing the love and light of God move and work through her. How strong and confident she was in her relationship with him. And I just thought to myself, I want that. I want to be confident in my relationship with God and love and speak his word. So I took the step and brought my children and myself to CTC and I surrendered my life back to Jesus. I gave all that self-doubt, anxiety, and depression to him. And ever since that day, I felt so much lighter and confident because I know now I am a good wife, mom, friend, and daughter because God made me that way and has given me everything I need to be her. I will never put God on the back burner again because I've never been on his. I've always been his priority and he will always be mine. I'm ready for him to use me and spread his love to everyone I know and speak his word. Today, I am going public with my faith. <laughs> Tiffany, Jesus said every disciple baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And because of your confession of faith, Today I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and according to scripture, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit.
For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Come on, once more. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. give you our highest praise. Come on, if you've been faithful, say amen. Amen, Amen, church. Well, hey, we're going to go to Minute to Mingle. Get to know the people around you today as we prepare for the message. All right, well, good morning. It's good to be in church today. It is, um, there's so much to celebrate today. There's so much to celebrate, so much going on. A a lot of, I guess you can say, exciting things on on the calendar this weekend. The the one one thing I I do want to make sure that we address and um, in, in, in our own way celebrate is, is the fact that this weekend, uh, I love the fact that our country has set it aside for us to honor those that have, that have fallen for our freedom. So can we just honor them just for a moment here? Yeah, including some, there are people right even from the CTC congregation who have given their life in, uh, in order to fight for our freedom in this country that is the greatest country in the world. The greatest country in the world is right here, the United States of America. Maybe you guys don't believe that, but I do, and I'm gonna believe that the rest of my life, all right? Another thing, too, that uh, we want to honor, we want to honor um, many of you that have graduated high school and college over the past week. If, if you graduated this past week, will you stand? Will you stand? We got some graduates. There we go. There they go. There they go. Congrats. Congrats. All right, you guys can sit. Y'all have been expensive this weekend. Um, and, last, and lastly, Lastly, uh, I, I better say this, or the Pentecostals are going to be mad at me, but it is Pentecost Sunday. And yeah, there we go. There we go. Miss Kathy was ready. Uh, so if you, if you aren't familiar with that, what that means on, on the calendar, especially in the, in, in the Christian world, when we look at the calendar, Pentecost Sunday is a representation, uh, and it's a, it's a celebration, honestly, of the 50 days, it's day number 50 from when Jesus ascended, I'm sorry, when Jesus resurrected. When Jesus resurrected, he was on the earth for another 40 days. When Jesus resurrected, he was on the earth for 40 days and, and visited with, at different times with disciples and different people. And then he ascended to heaven and for, and for 10 days, uh, those of you that understand the story and know the story, in, in Acts chapter two, you can read it. But for 10 days, there was a group of believers, 120 believers, and in, an up, and in the upper room, in that moment, and what we celebrate was the moment of Pentecost when the baptism of the Holy Spirit fell on those 120 and started the New Testament church. Are you grateful that you're in a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, believes in the gifts of the Spirit? I can tell you right now, without the power of the Spirit and the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, we would not be here today. We would not be here today. And I'm so thankful that we are a Bible-believing, Spirit-filled church. 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray here real soon. I do, I do want to thank uh, so many of you that have given. I didn't, I didn't say this in first service, but I should have. Uh, we leave for youth camp this coming week, and I want to thank so many of you that have given towards that and prayed for it. We're taking about a group of 100 up to Prescott for, for camp, and we're honored to do so. And then, of course, we want to pray for, for, for so many that are traveling. Our, our team is, is, is away in South Africa right now. There, there's been some good ministry. There's been some ups and downs for sure. But uh, most importantly, there's been good ministry. Uh, the Lord has been glorified, and, and they're making an impact out there. So we want to pray for them. We want to celebrate what God's doing there. And, of course, as always, we want to pray for all of the local Bible-believing churches in our city. We just firmly, firmly believe that we're, we're not empire builders, and we're not uh, a, a church that's been called uh, to walk alone, to serve alone, to win a city on our own. So we're thankful for the other Bible-believing churches uh, here in Yuma. So let's, let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you for the worship team and, and such an incredible atmosphere in, in your presence already this morning. We ask, Lord, that you be with each and every serve team member. We ask that you be uh, with, with us as we sit here and we receive your word. Lord, I pray that uh, as the South Africa team continues to, to navigate this, this uh, God-appointed trip that they're on, that you continue to use them. Lord, we ask that you protect them. Lord, I ask uh, if, there's, if there's any sickness going on or any, any things that they're dealing with when it comes to their body, that you heal, that you protect, that you guide. Lord, we, we know that you have a plan for each and every one of them while they're there. So we're just believing that your will will be done. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the students that are getting ready to head off to camp. We ask that you prepare our hearts and minds and, and, and that we experience everything that you've set out for us to experience while we're there. We thank you, Lord, that we're in a city that, of people that, that love you, that know you. We thank you that there are pastors called to this city, that there's, there are churches that were planted in this city by your design, and we just pray that your will is done in each and every one of those. We thankful, we're thankful for our, our lead pastors. We're thankful for our elders. We're thankful to be in a house that is aligned with your heart. And we ask, God, that as we move forward in this service, that you speak, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to hear your voice, voice clearly as we once again position ourselves to grow closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, will you stand with me? I'm going to dive into this message. Some of you guys already have the grill on low, so I don't want, I don't want to cause any accidents, you know. The cover of the boat's already off, and you just, you, you, we're here at church, though, so... So we're going to dig in, we're going to hear from Jesus, and then we're going to go out and have a great time. But for now, let's go to Acts 13. Acts 13. I'm excited to share from my heart this morning. Acts chapter 13, verse 36. This is the Apostle Paul talking about Jesus and the value of his death, burial, and resurrection, and the fact that only Jesus can and has resurrected uh, himself from the grave, and we actually read this verse, it might have been one or two Sundays ago, and it really struck me, and I just want to talk a bit from this single verse and in the, in the, in the heart of it, the, the, the mind behind it. Verse 36 in Acts chapter 13, and it says this, this is not a reference to David, for after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors and his body Decayed after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died. Lord, thank you for your word. Speak clearly. Lord, speak to us what you want us to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. When I, when I heard that verse, it, it made me, it kind of struck me and made me think about the fact that David lived such an incredible life. If you know anything about the Bible, if, you're, if you've read the Bible or if you've heard, even heard Bible stories, uh, odds are you've heard about David defeating a giant and David being known as someone after God's own heart and David writing so much of the Psalms. And, and honestly, uh, a lot of the songs that we sing even today came from the, the pen of David and, and David being a great and mighty king, David passing on his kingdom to his son and his son uh, being uh, just such a, a mighty man and having other mighty uh, sons and, and, and just so much we, we read. But then, then we look and see that David, uh, in, in this portion of scripture, that David's life is, is, is highlighted with one line, summarized into one line. And it made me think to myself, no matter what David accomplished, 
in all actuality, I, I, when, when it's all said and done, our, our lives will be summarized in one line. And what will that line be? What will they say? What will they say? Oftentimes you think about when you, see, when you go see a, 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 what, what they call a headstone or a gravesite or whatever. You, you know, they see the, 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 the year they were born, the year they passed away, and there's just a dash right there in the middle. And that dash for David was that he did the will of God in his own generation. You know, I don't think it's as important for us to celebrate the fact that David was a king, but he was, or the fact that David was one of the greatest warriors of all time, but he was. But the greatest celebration you can have when it comes to seeing what that dash represents in his life is that he did the will of God in his generation. None of us, none of us truly know when our life will come to an end and the truth is, it normally takes our entire life of navigating and positioning and asking and listening and praying to know our purpose and to know where God is actually taking us, to know the, the destiny he has for us. But the truth is, that entire dash is not about the career itself. It's not about being a parent. It's not about being a, a husband or a wife or the amount of money you make. That dash is all about, did you do the will of God in your generation? And I just want to take a look at the life of David. I want to take a look at what he did, and, and I broke it down into about three phases of life. And, and I truly do, at the end of this, I want to share my heart on what CTC has in place for the next generation. You know, we talked, there was a message uh, on Mother's Day that was directed primarily towards women, but we all benefited. And on, on Father's Day, there's, there's going to be a, a message that's probably directed towards men, but we're all going to benefit. But today, I want to I preach and talk about the next generation, and I firmly believe that God's going to speak to every one of us about the role we can have either as the next generation or as we pour into the next generation. Looking at the life of David there, I did my best to break it down into about three phases of life, and, and initially the phase of life was his development, his development. Many of you maybe heard the story when David was anointed to be king. He was anointed to be king uh, as a young boy and actually anointed in his home when he wasn't even invited to be there. He was out at the, out, out at the fields, and, and, and the prophet came to his house, and, and all the other brothers were passed up, and they had to call David from, David from the fields, and he was anointed to be king, and as soon as he was anointed, what did he do? Went back to the fields. Some say it was for 10 years, and, and there's other different uh, timelines that, that before David became the mighty warrior that is. But, but it's important for us to recognize, and that first I want to talk to the, the, the kids, the teens, the 30s, and the, the, even the early 40s in the room, and talk about the fact that, that David, knowing and even declared to be the next king, went right back into where he was being developed, went right back into the place that God had called him to in that season, in that moment in time, in that part of his life, in that phase of his life. And, and we see, what did David do in that time? What did David do while he was in the fields, while he was even, there were some portions of time where he was even in the caves. What did David do during that time as the next generation, knowing that someday he would have opportunities, knowing that someday he would be in the seat, knowing someday he would have the platform, knowing someday he would have uh, the influence. What did David do in that season? I just want to break down some things that he did. He served. He tended. He tended the sheep. I'd like to say that he, he invested where he was at and gave his whole self to it. Knowing someday he'd be living in a palace, but for now, I got to make sure I'm not stepping in sheep poop and making sure I'm moving them to get water. And, and, he, and he did that with excellence. In that season... And as we still get to sing his songs today, what did David do? He worshiped. Well, I, I, I want to talk about just for a second why I believe it was so important that David worshiped and that it was recorded that he worshiped so much in that development season. It's because in those early seasons, in the early seasons of our life, in, in the early years of our life, it is especially in this current society, it is so easy to already develop a desire to be worshiped a desire to be followed. In fact, I, I believe our society is set up for us to self-promote. We're in a, sel a selfie generation to, to self-promote, to build your own brand, to build your own name, to try to be rich early, be rich quick, to be an influencer by any means necessary. And, and, and as we have, have seen uh, from Genesis to Revelation, we were never designed 
to be worshiped. We were designed and purposed to give worship, to be the people who give praise. So in order for David to be successful as a king, he had to know who his king was to begin with. And he learned how to worship, not in a worship service, but learned how to worship alone. Learned how to worship in a place. It, the, the, the Bible often talks about how much David cried. He worshiped even through brokenness. Worship even through seasons where, where he's thinking to himself, God, I know who you called me to be in the future. Why am I still being treated as this? Why did you send me right back into this place? And he had the opportunity in those young years, even as a warrior, to serve someone else's vision. To serve someone else's vision. David was, was, a, was a warrior. David was a, a leader in battle with a king over him. Yes, he was anointed to be king, but he still was called to serve a king. I, it's so important. We, 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 I've seen many times on our staff when, when our elders and, and lead pastor make hires or when they, when they bring someone on to, to, to lead a ministry team, uh, they, they, they never lead a ministry team until we see how they do serving someone else's vision. You never are at the top until we see how you do as a part of the team. How do you handle a no? How do you handle a yes? How do you handle correction? How do you handle instruction? And, and David, through those training seasons of his life, understood the importance of tending, of serving, of worshiping, of preparing, building someone else's vision. In, in, in these young years, I think it's important that we emphasize discipleship over leadership. You've got to learn how to follow, and you've got to learn how to lead yourself before you can lead others. Listening over publishing. We're in a society where we're, we have media available to where we can publish all of our thoughts, we can publish our pictures, we can publish, publish uh, our emotions, and we can put it for the whole world to see. But it's so important to learn how to listen and to process and to be slow to speak over publishing. I appreciate the idea of publishing. I appreciate the opportunity to publish, but we've got to learn how to listen. Younger generation, we've got to learn how to listen before we publish. And one more thing, learn how to value the process over just celebrating the results. Oftentimes, it is the process. David, David didn't have to, there was no reason for him to highlight and celebrate the results of his shepherding because that was all about the process of someday being a king. Yes, there was good things to celebrate. Yes, and I'm not against celebrating the small wins and celebrating the little victories, but we, we don't have to be in a place where we evaluate that season based on results. We've got to evaluate every season of our life based on how we navigated the process. I love, uh, there, there are probably some math teachers in the room. I, 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 was, I, was, I was pretty good at math-ish in school growing up, and and I remember oftentimes I would be able to calculate things in my head and, and the teacher would be like, Tyrone, those are right answers, but I've got to know how you got there. Because if you got there the wrong way, you're not going to be able to do it when it gets tougher. So I didn't and I'm in ministry right now. Um, but one more thing about that and probably the most one thing, I'm, I think I'm going to dig into this age group a little more than the rest of them, but. One, one other thing that David learned how to navigate in that season, and I, and I really kind of grasped this from reading scripture, but also one of my favorite books called A Tale of Three Kings. David had to learn when it was time to use his slingshot and position himself to fight, and he had to learn when it was time to put his slingshot away and just duck the spear. He used his slingshot in the killing of Bears, lions, a giant, and all of these different animals and all these different parts of battle, he used his slingshot. God, God I, it wasn't even one of those slingshots. Why am I pulling it back like that? It was, it was a different one. But he used his slingshot in war. He used his slingshot, not I mean, in war, they used it, but you guys understand what I'm saying. In early battles, he used a slingshot. That was his weapon. Yes, God has given you a weapon, but the weapon you have been given is only supposed to be used in the way he's designed you to use it. Oftentimes, it's important to understand when there's someone placed over you, they are given a spear. Saul had a spear. Why does he have a spear? He is built for battle. But he also has a spear because he's in position where he has the liberty, has the liberty at that time to make decisions, how to say yes, how to say no, how to eliminate, how to accept. And unfortunately enough, because Saul wasn't developed the way that he was supposed to be, he used that spear on people. He attempted to use that spear on people that didn't deserve it. 
He was an underdeveloped leader. Saul, Saul, even though anointed and called by God, Saul had allowed his insecurities in that season to make him attempt to kill David. And oftentimes we see David ducking and dodging that spear. But if David didn't have to duck and dodge that spear, he wouldn't have been built the way he was built and he wouldn't have been prepared when that spear was, when that spear was put in his hand and he became king. You have to know when it's time to fight and you have to know when it's time to duck. Because that leader above you is learning, growing, developing, fighting through their own issues, fighting through their own problems. And there are times where they will throw spears at you. And it, that, doesn't, that doesn't elicit a response of you firing your slingshot at them. You duck the spear and you thank the Lord that you're still on the journey. And when you get that spear in your hand, you're going to remember what it's like when that spear was thrown at you. We good? Slingshots and spears. Second season of life I want to talk about is when David was king. This was the prime, uh, I want to say the prime of his life. Uh, oftentimes it's the prime of, 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 a, lot of, of a lot of lives when, when you're in that range of your mid-30s all the way up until your, maybe your mid-60s. And I, I don't want to compartmentalize people, but, but oftentimes it's in that season of life when we're at the, the peak of, of money making. And, and our kids are, are old enough to where we can begin to, to travel and different things. And you're, and you're navigating the, 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 these seasons. Probably one of the most important things that we want to recognize in this season is now instead of just being the upcoming next generation, you are the generation of people that have someone under you. Now you are in a position where there's a spear in your hand. Now you're in a position where you have to steward and navigate this season, and it doesn't just affect you, it affects others. What did David do in that season? How did David navigate that season? First of all, he made a decision to lead, and second, he made a decision and understood that it was his responsibility to steward. To steward. Stewardship is often mentioned. I'm slowing down, Theo one. I'm so sorry. Stewardship is often mentioned I didn't talk to Jesus right now. That's the translator. Okay, sorry about that. The person translating in Spanish, I went too fast in first service, so I, I, I audibly let him know I am slowing down. Stewardship is often mentioned when it comes to money, but how many, how many of us understand that we are stewarding a season of our life? We are stewarding a season with our kids in our house. We are stewarding a season of leadership, whether it's in ministry or in business, and it's important for us to recognize that because people don't belong to us, and in all actuality, our money doesn't belong to us, and for an absolute fact, our time doesn't belong to us, so all of, it, all of it is given to us to steward. How are we stewarding the lives? When, I, when, I, when, I, when I'm looking at so many of our, our, our graduates, and, and we had a, a, quite a bit of graduates, high school graduates this year in our youth ministry, I thought to myself, God, I pray that we stewarded that season with them well. When you have your kids in your, your house or, or, or when, you're, when you're a leader of, a, of, a, of, a, of an organization or a leader of a job site or, or, or anything else, you, you got to think to yourself, I'm only, there's an end date to this. I'm stewarding it. And some people say, well, I'm going to be a parent for my kid's entire life. You sure are, but you're going to be stewarding different seasons of that. Your stewardship, your stewardship when they're changing diapers and the stewardship when they're, when they're in elementary and high school and college is all going to look different. The seasons are going to look different. Your, your, your hands-on process is going to look different. And, and the question is, how are you stewarding the season you're in right now? How are you stewarding the season you're in right now? One thing that David did in that, in, in, in that place when he, was, when he was at what we can call those prime years is he established the presence of God. He made sure that the ark was brought to Jerusalem. He wanted the presence to be where he was, where he was leading. I think it's a great reflection of Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom. David knew if I'm going to steward this well, God has to be in the middle of it. God has to be in the center of it. God has to come first in, in all things. How can we affect the next generation as we're stewarding these seasons, as, as we're, we're walking through this season? I think also, too, it's important for understand, to understand we're going to have some falls during this season. And our falls, how many know in, in, this, in this phase of life, falls are more impactful, and I don't mean just physically. Falls are more impactful during this season than before. Because when I'm sitting in a counseling and a 15-year-old breaks up with their girlfriend, and then in another counseling, a 45-year-old uh, goes through a divorce with their wife of 15 years and they have four kids, the impact is different. Because in that season of life, you have dependence. In that season of life, there are people under you. If it, getting, getting, getting fired from a job uh, as a 20-year-old that works at Chick-fil-A and getting fired from a corporate when you thought you were going to be CEO for another five years has a different impact. 
No, we can't always prevent those things. But what we have to understand is in that season, we have to rebound and rebound quickly. We have to rebound and help other people rebound. I, I listed you've got to recover and help other people recover. Because during that season, the, the, the blows of life, the lows of life are so impactful. But we've got to continue to walk in our purpose. We've got to continue to know who God has called us to be. What can we give to the next generation while we're in that prime time of our life? We can, we can, we can give them our time. Time is, the, time is one of the greatest currencies we can give. We can give our time. We can teach. We can listen. We can, we can have intentionality in our words and our actions. Why am, I, why am I saying these things? It's because during the prime of our life, it's easy to be selfish with our time. But it's actually in the prime of our life when our time and our journey and our ups and our downs are most valuable to the generation behind us. It's okay if we make mistakes even when we bring them along. It's okay that they see our scars. It's okay that they see our ups and downs. No, we're, we're not gonna get, ever get in a place where we're trying to project our pain on, on a younger person or we're trying to advertise our pain or our, 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 down, our downfall to, literally downfall, to, to, to younger, younger people. But our time with them is incredibly valuable because of, of what they can glean from our life. Our time listening to the next generation in this prime season of life is so important. Creating space, I, I love how, how uh, Todd and Amanda Mellon they, they are in, I would say, really a prime time of their life. They're both built, they're building businesses. They have an incredible family, a lot of great, God's doing a lot of great things in them and through them. But, but they made a decision to open up space and time, even in this busy season for the next generation. They, 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 they have a son that's in high school and, and, and a lot of his, his friends are, they're looking for something to do on Monday afternoons because they get out of, Yuma Union High School District gets out early on Mondays. So they opened up their home for students to come have lunch, come hang out and sit and spend, spend time with, with each other every Monday after school in that place what did they create space and time and you know what they get to do they get to sit and listen to conversations they get to drop little nuggets of wisdom they get to to position students to be in a place where they're influencing each other and they get to uh, steward the moments and the interactions that they're having with these with these young people I firmly believe there's other things that they could be doing with that time but I'm thankful for what they're doing. And the truth is, I see so much fruit in those young people and in that family as a result of them making time, as a result of them taking the time to open up their home. Notice that has nothing to do with being in vocational ministry. That's not asking, can I use the church building to do that? That's them opening their home and ministering to students in a way that works for their lane, for their margin, and their season of life. You guys with me? Final phase for David. His latter years, in the latter years, I think one thing that we understand, we, we can understand that what we can do for the next generation is understand that we are still valuable and we can make ourselves available. Understand that we're still valuable to the next generation and make ourselves available. This is a season when you can impart wisdom. One thing, one thing I love about having mentors in my life that, are, that, that have lived so many more years than me is they don't freak out about the things that I do. I, I, I call in a panic and I'm sending texts, this is, this is a 911, seriously. What do you need? Why? Because they've, they've lived enough life to know what a big deal is and what it's not. They lived enough, enough, enough life to know you're gonna get through this. They lived enough life to know, no, don't take that kid to the ER. It's just a little bump on the head, you know. And I'm thankful, just like David did in those latter years, that he called, called his, 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 his circle around him. And at different times, he called different leaders to him so that in those latter years, instead of just laying and, 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 and asking the Lord to take him, he imparted wisdom. He imparted words. He imparted thoughts. He oversaw leaders. He oversaw uh, the people who were not only uh, being effective in that time, but also those that were leading others that are being effective in that time. And one of the most important things I think we can do in that, in that phase is be encouraging. Life is often discouraging enough. Our own mistakes are discouraging enough. Our own faults, our own downfalls, discouraging enough. And, and when you have someone from the generations above you that's encouraging you to stay in the race and to stay in the fight, oftentimes that's, that's all the gift you need from them. 
Oftentimes, you, you never realize how valuable that is coming from someone above you. I, I, I want to encourage the, the generation that maybe, I, and I don't want to define latter years, but, but, but you understand when you're in those senior times, to, I want to encourage you to, to give more direction than correction. Correction is great, but correction doesn't take me to where I need to be. But if you direct me to where I'm supposed to be going, it's easy to tell a person what not to do. But I believe there are people that are wise in their years and that have had a lot of experience, even in this room, even watching online right now, who can say, I can actually create a space to not just tell people what they're doing wrong, but I can model what to do right. Direction over correction. I think correction is important. I think the Holy Spirit even corrects us. The Holy Spirit convicts us and their needs. We all need a person in our life that can, that can tell us what we don't want to hear. I'm, I'm not saying against any of those things. But as a senior voice in someone's life, direction is so much more powerful than correction in the context that I'm discussing it. You guys, you guys understand what I'm saying? Uh, also, to prayer over critiques. Prayer over critiques. It's easy to sit back and talk about a generation that you may not understand or a generation that seems far removed from the values and the, and the morals that, that your generation helped establish, but, but please pray more than you say. Please pray more than you post. And please understand that, the, that this younger generation, they see what you're saying. And even though it was well-intentioned for them, because you're correcting instead of directing and because you're rebuking, it's a spear. When the truth is, with just a little time, and space created, it can actually be a gift. Your words can be a gift. Your words can be valuable. Your words can be uh, what, what changes the direction of that young person. Another way I put it was modeling over reflecting. Reflecting meaning what? In our day, in my time, and what the younger generation is asking you to do is to show us what you mean by that. The example I used in first service is, is, is if people in, in an older generation say, man, chivalry really is dead now. Ask the, the, the youngest, gen, ask Gen Alpha and Gen Z what chivalry means. They have no clue what that word even means by definition. But if you guide, direct, create space, spend that time, your, even, even your words and frustrations will will turn into an opportunity to, to teach. The greatest, greatest example we can see of the, the, the difference in this is in the life of, of Moses and Joshua. Moses was a, was a great leader, and Moses led, as we know, led a generation. Moses led the children of Israel. Uh, Moses did what God called him to do, and one of the greatest parts of that is how he developed Joshua. He developed Joshua by bringing him along. In Exodus 33, it says that, that when Moses was in the tent, he would talk to God face to face as if he was a friend, and Joshua would stay in there even when Moses would walk out. Why? Because as Moses brought Joshua along, he began to see God at work in the, Joshua began to see God at work in the life of Moses, and he quickly caught on to the fact that the work God is doing in Moses is as a result of the time he's spending with Moses. And Joshua, not by way of a step-by-step -step program, but by way of exposure, came to the understanding that if this is the place that God imparts into Moses, this is where I want to be. I love, Mo Moses did so much just by modeling to that next generation. He also, uh, he would record, he would write down the victories and he would recite them and he would read them to Joshua, understanding what God did here in our day. Understand what God did here in your day. That's why I called this message in your day because we've got to understand what is God doing for us and through us in my day, in your day. What does God want to do with you in your day? And it was a beautiful thing because Joshua, as, as many of us know, Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land. But then we see in the Bible, that in, in Judges chapter 2, that it says that the next generation after Joshua did not acknowledge the Lord and did not remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. It also says, the Bible also says that it's only the ones that were in direct the, the generation with Joshua that actually lived life during Joshua's time that understood and served the Lord. Why? Because Joshua only thought about his day and didn't think about the next generation behind him. What a difference, even though it was modeled for him, 
Even though the, the, the leadership that he was able to walk in was as a result of someone bringing him along, he didn't do it for the next, so it came to an end. I don't know about you, but I, I firmly believe that my family, the ministry I get to lead, and my city will be better when I leave it, and it's gonna get better even from there. We, I have an understanding that God calls us to steward seasons and steward places and, and steward these, these, these years of our life so that our shoulders can be their floor, so that we can be in a place where they are elevated and pushed forward in the purposes and destinies uh, that God has called them to. But as we see with Joshua, it can come to an end if we're not thinking of them. So what's the plan and what's the system of CTC? How, 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 what, what does CTC have in place to make sure that we're reaching the next generation in the way that God has called us to? I can tell you this first. It starts with our nursery, preschool, and kids' church. Our nursery, preschool, and kids' church is an incredible ministry that is, is not a daycare. From three months old, up, upstairs in those buildings, they are hearing the gospel of Jesus. They're getting broken into small groups so that they can build community. They're understanding who God called them to be so they won't believe what the world tells them God has called them to be. They're understanding who they are in Christ so that the world can't change or redefine who they are. They're understanding the word of God from that early age. It's why we have VBX in the summer so that we can take a deeper dive into the word so we can create fun atmosphere so we can create community uh, right here on our campus, and, and it's the reason why we have so many volunteers for VBX, because they want to make a difference in that generation, knowing that someday they're going to be leading others, that they're going to be making a difference in those lives. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for, for Jolene and, and Gabe and for Amber and, and, and Anthony and, and what they've established in our kids' ministry, but I, I do want to, I, I want to share a testimony real quick from, from our kids' ministry, because I, I believe it paints a, a picture of why the next gen is so valuable, even in the season of life for, for, for kids. So I remember one year, uh, there, was a, it was a, there was a, our church was smaller at the time, so you always knew when it was somebody's birthday, you always knew. How many have been in a church where you like stand up if it's your birthday and then you have a potluck at the end and all those different things? So, so we knew when someone had a baby and all those different things. And I remember that year, uh, I hadn't seen the baby yet, but I knew a baby was born. So we're, it was the Christmas service of that year. As a matter of fact, it was 2006. And there was, we're doing a Christmas, you know, the Christmas play, Christmas program back in the, you know, those years when everything was a program. And we're doing the Christmas program. And down this aisle comes Mary and Joseph. The hood was over them and they were walking. They had this new, newborn baby in their arms. And Mary and Joseph came walking down this aisle and they, they came up. There was actually a staircase that went up the middle of this stage. And they get on the stage and, and they reveal themselves. And, and, and we realize it's the family that just had a baby that month before. And they pulled off the blanket, and that newborn baby was baby Jesus that day. Like, we, they, they used a real baby. And, and I, the reason why that's so significant to me is because that, that couple, Mike and Marisol Davis, they're right there, matter of fact. I don't know if you guys were in here. Mike and Marisol Davis, they had already made a decision. Even though their kids were small, they had a, they had a, a, a young daughter and a newborn baby. They made a decision, in, in, even in that season, we're going to serve the next generation, even as our kids are coming up in it. We're not just going to release them to kids' ministry. With There's nothing wrong with that. But they made a decision. We're going to be in these programs. We're going we're gonna to go up and serve in the kids' ministry because we understand the impact that can be made. And if you want to see the evidence of that impact, one of those bushy-haired, good-looking boys that was with the camera today, raise your hand, Matt Davis. That was that baby. Now he's serving in the kingdom of God. On top of that, he serves in kids' ministry right along with his parents who 16 years later still serve faithfully into the next generation. It's, it's, it's interesting, though. They, they didn't know when they brought that baby on this stage that someday he'll be hel helping build ministry, that someday he'll be helping build conferences and worship nights both here and on his school campus. But they invested knowing if he knows Jesus and loves the church and has healthy community, God, you take it from there. On this, on this same, same stage... On the same stage, it was two or three years later, there was this young guy whose family came to the church by way of VBS. They, they knew that we were doing a VBS program. They had a bunch of kids, and they're like, we got to get our kids involved in different things. And they show up, and this guy, he had like this, this natural charisma, one of those young kids who just, just had a, like a good smile, and he can memorize lines, and he understood how to be a key part of the production of that play. And, and, and he, did, he was so good, he had like a recurring role for like three years in, in the, Christmas, the church Christmas program. And his family 
served in the Next Gen Ministry. And all of his siblings were there in the kids' church. And, and they had kids' church leaders, including the Davises, that loved on them and inspired them. With the Davises not knowing that that same baby that was in the program would serve under that kid who was an actor. And now Chris Lerma is the head of all of production here at CTC. And they get to serve alongside each other. Why do I mention that? Nobody was pouring into his life with the understanding that he was going to be the church production director. They knew he needed to know Jesus, love Jesus, and have healthy community and love his house. So now that kid that was in the church play and that baby that was probably out too early from the house here on this stage during the Christmas program get to serve together and build God's house as the next generation. I guess I can just add one more thing. Chris Lerma met Miranda Howdy at the time, a little CTC kid in this house, that they fall in love, and now she leads all of our guest services department out there in the front. Not knowing. We, we don't pour into the generation knowing they're going to be the next generation of leaders here in this house. The truth is there's, there's, there's young people that were here in this house that are doctors, that are lawyers, that are farmers, that are doing things out in the community. But all we know as we pour into them is that they're going to be people who love and know Jesus and love his house and have healthy community. That's the, that's the goal. I want to talk about our youth ministry just real quick. I'm so thankful to have an opportunity to, to lead in that space you know, like I said, do we have a picture of, of, of some of the grads? I know we had some of the, the grads. We had about, um, I don't know, we had about 30 plus high school graduates this year. And, 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 I, and I think to myself, when we're looking at them, did, did, we, did, we, did we steward well? Did we, did we navigate that season well? Did, we, did, did God, did you make the impact uh, in them that, that, that we were supposed to help navigate? But the truth is that I see them worship. I see there was even a moment today where, where a group of the girls that we've poured so much of our life into over the past few years went and grabbed my daughter with the tweens and worshiped with her, which I could sit here and fall apart just thinking about that. But, but the truth is it's, it's when I look at them now worshiping, but also when I look at the younger ones of, of our youth ministry. Matter of fact, where's the picture of Glenn? Where's the picture of Glenn? See, Glenn is in the middle of that junior high sandwich. He's, he's, he's giving a big hug right there. And, and, and see, I remember so many of these graduating seniors when they were Glenn's age, and, and this is what their life looked like. Now, the truth is, that circle of boys, that's his best friends, that's Elias and Jackson. They're, they're, every one of those boys, I, and I'm not making this up, their life could be a movie. They have experienced things that you watch on Netflix, each and every one of them, and, and, they're, and they're best friends, but I'm going to tell you, tell you Glenn's story. Glenn is, is, is legally deaf. He has, ear, ear, he has hearing aids in, and if he takes those out, it's, it's zero. He can't hear anything at all. He's, he's never known his dad. His dad's never been in his life, and his mom died four years ago. He lives with his grandma, who's on a walker. And I look at this moment a kid who should be a statistic based on his disability, a statistic based on, on his dad not being in his life, and a statistic based on his, his mom passing away at such an early age in elementary school. And I think about the fact that he's surrounded by people that love Jesus in that moment of worship and that he has people holding up his arms and, and reminding him who he is in Christ and, and, and reminding him once again that no matter what they face, they're going to get through it together. And, and, and even the fact that, that months ago, I got a phone call from his, from his grandma, Miss Pat, and, and when I answered the phone, she was in tears because she said, we didn't know where to go from here. We felt so hopeless. He felt so rejected. He felt so lost. He was, he was in a place where he didn't think that anybody understood him. He didn't think that anybody wanted to, to live life with him. And I think to myself, what a great opportunity to be able to lead someone like that. Yeah, we do a lot of soda chugs and hot Cheetos and jump up and down and all these different things, and that's, that's just a part of the packaging. But the truth is, our youth ministry exists so people like Glenn can come and encounter the reality and the presence of God, and he can have healthy community, and he can know Jesus, and he doesn't have to live this life alone. You guys can come on up, team. Because it doesn't just end with our youth ministry. And it doesn't just end with with the fact that the next generation continues to, to, to be invested in and to be poured out into. I, I, I love the fact that, that we have a, a ministry now, our city leadership school, where we've had 30 plus graduates who've been activated into ministry and activated into uh, opportunities to, to serve and serve the church or serve in the community with, 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 with leadership training. I wanna, actually wanna show the picture of Andy. Where's Andy? There we go, that's Andy right there. See, Andy, Andy is, grew up in California. And Andy grew up loving Jesus, grew up uh, knowing that there was a call in his life, and, and, and he got to his senior year of high school, and, and he was dead set on med school. He had the ability to go to med school. 
He had uh, the, 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 definitely had the, the intelligence, uh, and he was even positioned in a place where he was living in California where there were schools available, but he knew that there was a call in his life. And God stopped him dead in his tracks, and there his senior year of high school, once he graduated, he packed up all his stuff to, and moved to Yuma, Arizona in order to do our city leadership school. And I think to myself, God, if you are going to send people from different places around the country, can you prepare us? God, can you, can you develop us to make sure that we steward that season well? And not only did Andy graduate from that program, but Andy graduated from that program. Uh, he got into a place where, where he knew his, his heart and his mind was sold out for ministry for the rest of his life. And instead of just taking that and, and becoming someone who's, who's developing and going out and, and, and just using that knowledge and wisdom for himself, he served for three years on the city leadership staff in order to pour into the people coming after him. And then he combined with a group of some of the other graduates and they launched the City Lights, uh, the city Lights Young Adult Ministry. Now there's people, college age young people who are navigating uh, being in college, uh, navigating understanding their finances, navigating understanding relationships, and they have a place that they can call home. They have a group that they can call home. I wanna, I wanna show one more person who was, was, was on that, that's on that team with him. This is Elisa. Elisa's the greatest. I'm gonna cry on this one. I'm gonna do my best not to. But you see, Elisa came to our church in high school. She came as a result of, of, of her younger siblings coming to our youth ministry. Elisa tells stories of being between the ages of 13 and 18 where she was so stricken by anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts, she would have to get in the shower so that her family wouldn't hear the screams, the gags, and sometimes full-on throwing up as a result of the attacks on her body and her mind. She would lay in bed night after night having to bury her face in a pillow so that no one could hear the screams. Not screams because of an event, not screams because of a specific relationship, but just the attack of life just the weight of life and just the lies that the enemy was trying to speak to her, her ears, her heart, and her mind. One day she showed up for herself to, to city youth and then she was crazy enough to come to something that we used to call a lock-in. And she was here hanging out all night, eating the food, playing the games. And then that night we had a late night prayer and worship service. And right here on her knees, Elisa, not only in that moment surrendered her life to Jesus, but was baptized in the spirit of God, received a complete healing and transformation from the inside out and be became one of not only our strongest influences in the youth ministry, but then became a leader. And now she's our city youth admin. And, 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 and not just to leave it there, now she's joined with Andy, the alumni that she went to city, city leadership school with, to now they helped launch together that City Lights Young Adult Ministry because they understand it's not just about the impact that it made in me, but I wanna create a space for that impact to be made in the lives of others. We honestly wanna take it a step further. That city leadership school did a great job of raising up leaders, but we understand that people want to be educated. They wanna be in college. They wanna have accredited systems. So in the fall, we are becoming a Portland Bible College affiliate and our leadership school is turning into a leadership college to where students can be educated the next teachers, preachers, leaders, with a true biblical foundation. All because we don't wanna just talk about the next generation. We want to pour into them the best we can. We wanna steward this season the best we can with these young people. And why does all this matter the most? Because it was by God's design for me in my day to serve the next generation. And it's by God's design for you in your day to serve the next generation. In one way or another, no matter if you're a part of the next gen, no matter if you're in the prime of life or in your latter years, there's a place for you to serve the next generation. What does the Bible say about that? What does the Bible say about generations? Is this just something that we're making up our, on our own? Is this something that our society is teaching us? It's no, it's this. In Psalm 45, it says this, I will bring honor to your name in every generation. Therefore, the nation will praise you forever and ever. Psalm 102 says, but you, O Lord, will sit on your throne forever. Your fame will endure to every generation. Psalm 90 says this, Lord, through all generations, you have been our home. Acts chapter two, when they're talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit, this promise is to you and your children and those far away. 
all who have been called by the Lord our God. And before I share this last verse, I, 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 wanna, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page and have an understanding of this. We can easily probably debate and argue about the delivery and the packaging of how we serve the next generation. You may go up to kids' church and say, well, why do they need these, what are they called? Goldfish. Why, do you, why, do, why does the youth have to post all their fun stuff on Instagram? Why do, why do the young, young adults have a pool night? Why, why did kids' church, why does kids' church have all these bright colors on the wall? Can I tell you something when it comes to ministry? All of that is just packaging. All that is packaging because the most important thing in each one of those, each one of those encounters is people knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, loving his house and having healthy community. The packaging shouldn't make a difference, but, but I realized that I was, I was thinking about this. The packaging has always brought critiques. The model has always brought critiques. I think all the way back to when Martin Luther hammered that 95 thesis on the door of the church, I'm sure there were people all over that said, how can that be effective? But our doctrine and our theology to this day is as a result of him stepping out and saying, I don't have to fall in the same mold as those before me because I wanna make a difference now and in my, the next generation. And those who made a decision to put preachers on Christian radio, people thought, how can someone experience the reality of God? How can someone find Jesus through a radio? But I'm thankful they did it. I don't know about you, but I grew up with Charles Stanley and David Jeremiah blasting on Saturday mornings in my house. And I know millions of people who wouldn't have heard the gospel of Jesus heard the gospel on the radio. And now generations after them get to serve. Same with TV. Oh gosh, MTV is on that screen. We, we, there's no way that people can preach through that same screen. Can they? Church on TV? I'm so thankful for guys like Jensen Franklin. I'm so thankful for guys like, like Bishop Jakes who, who, who made their, their, their television for all the way back to Billy, Billy Graham Crusades. It was critiqued heavily, but millions of people heard Jesus because someone decided, I don't care if they complain about the packaging. The methods and the models will always change. But I can tell you right now, if it worked being hammered on the door for the 95 thesis, and it worked through all the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s on the radio, and if it worked on all of the, the different TV networks and TV stations, people finding Jesus through a screen, you can't convince me that the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached on TikTok is ineffective. You can't convince me that people can't hear the gospel of Jesus on Instagram and have an encounter with him. You can't convince me that us posting our YouTube videos preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and we get messages from people all the way, all the way in Europe saying, I got impacted by that message. I wanna hear more about this Jesus you're talking about. It's all just packaging. And the last verse I want us to understand is Hebrews 13 says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we will forever preach his, his word. We'll forever declare his name. And I can tell you right now, this generation, right now, in this house, in this city, will proclaim the name of Jesus to this entire world, to this entire world, because God has called them to do so. And we, in our day, have an opportunity to be a part of that. Let's stand to our feet. I promise I'm not mad. I want to invite the, the altar team. I'm going to do something a little different. Altar team, come on up. I'm already over time, so. If you're standing here right now and you are, I want to say you're, if you're older than 60, 60 and up, 60 and up, will you raise your hand? There we go, 60 and up. 60 and up, 60, six zero and up, raise your hand. Let's close our eyes as their hands are lifted. If you're nearby, can you put a hand on them? Lord, I thank you so much for this generation. Lord, I thank you so much for the years that they've put in. Lord, I thank you so much for the faithfulness. Lord, I thank you so much for the call on their life. I thank you so much for, for, the, for the seasons, both, both highs and lows that have, have molded them who, into who they are. Lord, in this moment, we honor these people, we honor this generation, we honor the call in their life, and, and we ask, Lord, that even in this season, that in a way, even like never before, that you use them, in a way like never before, Lord, that you give them opportunities, space, 
and time to pour into the next generation, space and time to pour into others, space and time to speak into the lives of others. We thank you, Lord, for the wisdom. We pray for soft hearts for the generations behind them, soft hearts and ears to hear for the generations behind them. Lord, I, in Jesus' name, ask that you use each and every hand that's lifted right now in the lives of others in a way that only you can. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, how about a, about 40, 40 to 60, 40 to 60. Hands up, 40 to 60, 40 to 60. Look, your arm's all tired. <laughs> Stop. Like, <laughs> Lord, I thank you. I thank you for each and every hand that's lifted right now. Lord, I thank you that in this season, there's times you're calling them to run, there's times you're calling them to walk, but what they need to understand, Lord, is that you're calling them. Lord, you're calling some to ministry, some to business, some to, 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 to parenting, some not to parenting, some to teaching, some to, to leading, some to still following, but Lord, in this season, I pray that each and every hand that's lifted right now understands the impact that they can make as a result in their day of who you've called them to be. Lord, I pray against discouragement. Lord, I pray that if there's mistakes that have been made, that they can rebound, not rebound because they have the, their strength, but rebound because you can call them right back to their feet, call them back to a place of wholeness, call them back to a place of, of restoration. Lord, I, I firmly believe that, that, that in this season, they will begin to lead and steward in a way that only you can do through them, that they will begin to speak in the lives of, of, of their own kids and the kids of others, speak in the lives of employees that are, that are under them, uh, speak in the, in the lives of even friends and, and people that they're mentoring in their life with wisdom, biblical wisdom. Lord, I pray a confidence over them. Lord, I pray that they, they understand that when, when they are weak, that you are strong. Lord, I pray that they understand that, that the place that they're in, where their feet are, and, the, and, then, and those, even their, their, their kids or the people that they're overseeing, God, you place them there. And the grace on their life will carry them through. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that there are no seasons wasted. That there are no seasons wasted. Lord, I'm praying for a fresh wind, a fresh wind on this group, a fresh move of your spirit, a fresh desire to know your word, a fresh desire to be in worship, a fresh desire to go after God-given dreams. God-given goals. Somebody, I don't know who it is. God-given goals and dreams. Go after them in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for this group. In Jesus' name, amen. And lastly, youngsters, where are we at? Hands up. Littles all the way up to, littles all the way up to 40. Look at how disobedient they are. Like I'm looking at them and they're, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you knew what era and time they would be born in. You knew what era they would minister in. You knew what time and space that they would be developed in. And I pray, Holy Spirit, even now, that you begin to speak to their hearts and minds, first and foremost, who you are and who you've called them to be. Lord, let them have a confidence in who you are before they ever look to themselves for any type of performance, for any type of action, for any, for any type of accomplishment. Lord, let them first look to you for their confidence. Look to you for their safety. Look to you for their fulfillment. Look to you for their completion. Lord, I thank you for the callings in this room. I thank you for the purposes and destiny in this room with these young people. Lord, I thank you for the awakening. I thank you for the move of the Spirit in these young people. I ask, Lord, that this, this youngest generation is known for their zeal for your house, known for their understanding and application of your word, that this generation has a boldness like never before to stand true for you, to stand firmly in your word, to stand firmly in your truth. Lord, I pray for strong mentors. I pray for strong voices in their life. 
I pray that you protect their hearts and minds. I pray for good schools. I pray for, for good mentors. I pray for parents that are full of the spirit of God that lead those students in a way that leads them as the examples that we saw today that will love your house, that will serve your house, that will love their community. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that, like it says in, in, in the Bible, that your presence goes ahead of us. And we ask, Lord, for each and every one of these young people, like it says in your word, that what you've began in them will be brought to completion because of who you are. That the good work you've began in them will be brought to completion because of who you are. Thank you for seeds. Thank you for watering. Thank you for fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna open the altars. If you wanna come and get prayer, if you wanna bring your family, if there's pain in your body, we wanna pray for you, we wanna pray with you, we wanna give you the opportunity to come alongside someone. I'm telling you right now that none of, none of this would make any sense if Jesus didn't give his life on that cross for us. And because of that, he, he died for each and every generation and that remains true today and will remain true forever. We love you, please come for prayer. Let's go into this moment of worship. That which cost me nothing You've given more than I deserve I offer you a love that's burning Only because you love me first I will not bring that which cost me a city life group which is a small bible study group would like to join a serve team or would like to go public with your faith you can stop by the connect table on your way out of service where a team member can help you take that next step or if you're joining us online you can click the digital connect card if you've decided to give your life to jesus you can take the card found in the back seat of the back pocket of your seat, excuse me, that says say yes to Jesus and the Connect team will have a gift for you. Now lastly, this Thursday at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary, we are gathering for Awakening Prayer, which is a time of worship and prayer in the house. We pray you'll be able to join us. We love you, church, and we're so grateful you could join us today. We pray you have a safe and blessed week. You are dismissed.